Take your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2. This is part 2 of the message, Let This Mind Be In You. Let this mind be in you. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse, starting at verse 1. Let me read through this real quick, and then we'll, we'll jump on down to where we left off. I won't try to re-preach the first message. Um, Philippians 2, 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's that word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now, the second part of this message, and pray that... Uh, Lord, you said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I know we have the mind of Christ, but I know, sometimes I don't think we think like him. Uh, we don't allow those processes to uh, permeate our minds and our thinking. And a lot of it has to do with just not spending enough time in the Bible. And uh, Lord, I want to think like you. Uh, I don't want to think like me anymore. I don't like what I think. I like what you think. And... Um, I want to lean to what you say, not, not to what the world says. I want always to believe what you, what you tell me. So I pray, Father, we would have your mind. And pray that you just bless the message now and fill me with the Spirit of God. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. The first part of this message was about the mindset toward others. Because he mentions there the comfort of love, the fellowship of the Spirit, bowels and mercies. That's just um, mercy. You, you, you have um, compassion welling up inside you toward other folks. And you can get that way. You know, you can, you can, look, at a bunch of, uh, you can look at a bunch of evil, worthless sinners and then have compassion because you understand that they're a sheep that have no shepherd. They have no promise of, of eternal life. They have no God in their life. They're without God. The Bible says without God and without hope. That ought to stir a little bit. Listen, because you were there. You were one of those people. So there ought to be bowels of mercy. There ought to be mercy just for other Christians and, and other believers in Christ. So he talks about being like-minded, one accord, one mind. I, I, I strive in this church that we're like that. Now, we don't always agree on every little thing. We, we, I got so many different things this morning from y'all. That's fine. But for the main things, the book, uh, the major doctrines, uh, the future... We're in agreement. We're in agreement. And that's to be of one mind. Now, we don't all like the same things. We don't all like the same foods. We don't all like the same entertainment, whatever. Some like baseball. Some like basketball. Some of us don't like any of it. You know, maybe you like... That doesn't matter. It's talk about being of one mind when it comes to this book. Because it's the same Holy Spirit that's teaching me that's teaching you. And uh, it's showing me the truth. Uh, he talks about lowliness of mind uh, and caring about others, uh, the things of others. You know, when he says not looking upon your own things, but on the things of others, he's not talking about coveting their stuff. He's talking about you being concerned about their welfare, not just your own. You know, the, the my four and no more thing goes out the window when you get saved. It's my four and the whole world because you become a debtor to everybody. Why? Because God just took your debt and took care of it. Now all of a sudden he says, now what about their debt? Are you going to take care of that? Are you going to help them out? Are you going to show them how to get their debt paid for? Well, that makes you a debtor. So that's the mindset we ought to have toward our brothers and sisters in Christ and to the world is to have compassion. Now, I know sometimes that's hard. The more, the more I watch politicians, the less my compassion level for politicians is dropping to an all-time low. I mean, it's... Because I, I realize, y'all are going to get us killed. These politicians 
are probably going to get us killed or we'll starve to death. Now, if you don't believe that, you haven't been paying too much attention to the news of what is actually going on. But you'll find out soon enough, because if they, don't, if they do not correct, and they're not going to, if they don't correct the direction they're going, America's going down. They say, when? I don't know. So that might not be in my lifetime. Well, unless you're not planning on living six months from now. <laughs> well, I'm, I am saying that it's coming quick. Uh, you can only you can only do so much, and then the weight of it just takes you over. I've always just said it's like it's like it's like being right here. Y'all probably didn't get nervous if I just stood here if I did this all the time. He's going to twist his ankle, going to break his ankle, going to fall down, and I'm, I'm going to step back here because uh, I might. <laughs> and what you, what I try to tell Christians to do is just get away from the edge. Okay, you don't you don't have to live on the edge. A lot of Christians live right here. Don't live there. Get back from the edge. And I'm trying to tell a nation, get back from the edge. And they're just right up there, man. They're leaning right over. And one of these days, it's going over. You have no promise that God's going to preserve the United States of America. None. Show me in the Bible. No promise whatsoever. That's why he talks about a mindset here. It doesn't matter what government's in power. We might be all learning Chinese here. Who knows? I don't know. I know one thing, man. It can't go on like this. You can't be $32 trillion in debt and somehow the piper doesn't get paid somewhere. And we got a government just doesn't care. Remember I told you, economic collapse, do, that, that could happen very easily. And now the banks are starting to fail again. Okay. Just so you know. Um... Let's talk about your mindset toward God. Because he says, Let this mind be in you, which also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now the first, the first uh, verse, or the verse there in verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God, well, he said, kind of let this mind be in you. Am I in the form of God? If you're saved, you certainly are. You are back in his image. Um, when Adam, Adam lost the image of God in the garden, the day, I'm talking about the 24-hour period, the day that he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he died. You say, what died? His spirit died. Do you know what happens when you're born again, according to, to, to John chapter 3? Your spirit is regenerated. Not your flesh, not your soul, your spirit. So that which died in the garden, he lost the image, is restored at the new birth. So, he said there in Genesis 2.17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. Well, they didn't die physically. They lived another 500, no, it was 800, 500, 800. He lived another bunch of, bunch of years. Hundreds, bunches, bunches of years. But in John chapter 3, verse 3 to 7 says, Jesus answered, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the same time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Of course, now, you have to be a heretic to think that that's water baptism. You do, because water baptism is not in, is not in the context. But he mentions there, that which is born of flesh is flesh. There's your water birth. Any woman knows this. It's the men that don't understand this or the preachers that don't understand this and try to stick water baptism in there. He's talking about a water birth. Listen, you've got to be born the first time before you can be born again the second time. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. It is that part of you that is regenerated, reborn. Why? His spirit 
merges with your spirit to become one spirit, and now you're back in the image of God. Guess what? You can talk to Him. You can communicate with Him. You can understand His book. You are back in the, into the image of God, even though your flesh is wanting. Okay? You say, well, what about the flesh? Well, God's already judicially declared it dead. But you yourself are back in God's image. So when he says, who being in the form of God, yeah, we're in the, back in the image of God. This new creature is created perfect from the start. In Ephesians 4.24, he says that she put on the new man, which after God, okay, the new man is what's inside you. Okay? The new man, which, uh, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You're back in the image of God. You just, you say, well, I don't feel like it, but you are. Well, I don't know about that, but yeah, you are. You just don't know it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Well, there's a part of you that's not new, isn't it? The part I'm looking at. It's looking less new every day, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. We, were, we were talking about going bald, you know. And I can remember when my son-in-law jumped on the entire family and said, Why didn't anybody tell me <laughs> that I got this? <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, when I first saw mine, I went, Oh! My head was going back here. I'm like, what happened? But you know, on the inside, I'm a new creature. I'm a new creature. And guess what? I'm back in the image of God. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I realize the flesh isn't new, but the flesh is, is judicially declared dead. As far as God's concerned, you're dead. You're crucified with Christ. You're buried with Him. That's why you're to let the Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for, for it is God which worketh in you. You want that thing to come to the outside there. But notice he says, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What in the world are we going to teach this morning? That y'all equal with God? Yeah. Wow. Remember, he's talking about a man here. The man, Jesus Christ, who is what? Born of God. Are you born of God this morning? You see, it's about birthright. You know this. It's, it's true. It would be true in your home. It would be true if you went back to your family's home. I, I don't know. Maybe some of you knock on the door. I guess there's a point where you have some privacy. But usually you just walk. I know growing up, I didn't have to ask my parents' permission to walk in the house. Okay? Okay. Now, they would prefer my friends knock on the door, although some of them thought they didn't need to knock either. But my birthright gave me the right to just go on in. Why? That's my mom and dad. And you know, parents look at their children like they're equals. Your birthright gives you the position of being God's equal in this relationship. Yeah, because you can march right on into the throne room. The Bible says, let us come boldly into the throne of grace. That we might find help. Why? Because your family. Well, that's my kid. Oh, I, you can't come in here. Yeah, you can. It's my kid. It's my child. They're always welcome here. That's you thinking equality there, aren't you? This, was, this has nothing to do with the extent of one's power or ability. It has to do with relationship and the fact that you're immediate family. And that puts you on equal footing. I guarantee you, a, a father looks at his son as his equal. He is an extension of himself. He knows that. He believes that. That's my boy. He can even live vicariously through his son. If his son accomplishes much or does much or is a, a good man, he will, he, will, he, will live, he will live through them. Now, this relationship affords you great privileges. That's why he says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I'm, the privileges that you have now are over the moon. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, 
Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. You have access to God. He tells you that you're not to be overly concerned or careful about anything. Now you say, well, you know, I'm pulling out my hair. I've got an ulcer. Well, then, then you're not casting your care upon him, for he cares for you. You know, and I, listen, if there's anything I beat myself up over, you know, I'll, I'll watch the news for 10 or 20 minutes, and then all of a sudden this, this wave of doom and gloom comes over me. And the Lord says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm your God. You can save the doom and gloom for everybody else. It's not doom and gloom for you. And I think, yeah, but Lord, this is going to come and get us all. We're, they're coming for us. And he goes, I don't care. The only thing that's going to happen to you is what I let happen to you. And the only thing I want from you is faith that I'm in control. Yep. Be careful for nothing. Are you full of care? Are you worrying yourself to death? Turn off the news, which is good advice for me. And trust him. He's got you. Your privilege is you can go to him anytime. Anytime. And about everything. And especially the things that are weighing you down. The other thing he says, he says in Galatians 4, 7, which I think I probably quote that verse like four or five times in this passage. He says, wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, I know what I've been saying in Romans 1, but you'll find out he took on the form of a servant. Okay? But what, in, what are you in reality? You're a son. Thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. When you got saved, you immediately became an heir of God. What does God have? You say, I like what my neighbor has. It's yours. Okay? I like what another country has. It's yours. Okay? I like what the next solar system over. It's yours. He said, all things are yours. That's right. That's exactly right. All that I have is thine. Because you're an heir of God, it all... You say, but I want it now. You may not get it now, but you will get it later. All of it. It will be yours. We're not dividing this up with anybody that's an unbeliever. It's all going to be ours. The privilege is just over the moon. It's incredible. Not only do we have access to him about the cares of this world, but he says everything in this world is yours. Just not yet, but it will be. Because what? You're an heir. Not only... It, an heir of Christ, but a, or an heir of God, but a joint heir with Christ. That means you can get more. You can have more than just being an heir of God, where it will get you at least a new body, a mansion, a place in glory. Okay, but you can rule and reign with Jesus Christ when He comes back to reign on this earth. That'll take some effort on your part and some suffering on your part, but you can. But look at the privilege you've got. Um, where God's home is, there will yours be. Revelation 21, 2 and 3 says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. Wherever God lives, that's where I'm going to live. Wherever God is, that's where I'll be. For all eternity. I like that. The privilege of just being right next to my Creator. In fact, we have a proximity to Him that nobody else enjoys, to my knowledge. Because we're actually living in the tabernacle that He's in. And He's the light of it. The glory of it just lights this place. It is one huge city, and we're there. We are there. There's people outside that city. There may be people outside that planet. But we are in that city where he is. Talk about privilege. I've always said the greatest thing about the new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem is the God that created it. 
and a, he will be your chief desire. I, I know I, sometimes I think we, we don't think that because we think about what we want. We think about what we need. We think about what we'd like to have. And what you don't realize is, is what you really want, what you really need, and what you will really have is God. That's it, man. Everything else is just the cherry on top of the, uh, of the, of the cake or icing on the cake. It's just God throwing a little bit more out there, but it's He Himself that will fascinate you for all eternity. That will be a wonder to you. And that, let this mind be in you. Jesus understood this as a man and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You know, we're going to find out He didn't flaunt it here. I want to, because almost could. Well, that's my Heavenly Father. I'm a son of God. I'm a child of the King! And you know, I can really rub it in. But it's true! The world kind of thinks he's a nut. He's cracked. He thinks he's the Son of God. Well, I am a Son of God. I'm not the Son of God. But I definitely am in the family. God is my Father. My Heavenly Father. Now notice it says, he said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he says, but made himself of no reputation. That's where you don't flaunt it. That's where you don't flaunt it. Now if the Lord didn't make himself of no reputation, then you and I shouldn't. Okay? And sometimes, you know, some of the saints, they think, you know, I don't know, they... They just get this air about them that man they're just they're just living living better than the populace, you know, <laughs> better than everybody else, better than the they're living better than their brothers and sisters in Christ. They're just man, they're they're wonderful. I have never thought of myself as wonderful. Not one time. And if I ever got close to it, I disappointed myself every time. So I realize that I came from the bottom feeders, so I shouldn't flaunt what God gave me freely. Okay? Make myself of no reputation. It's not time for a reputation, except you don't want to get a bad reputation. When he says make yourself no it's just you don't want to stand there and pat yourself on the back and try to give yourself a good reputation. There's one thing about, it's one thing about getting up on that pedestal Remember, when you fall, the higher you are, the worse it looks. Yeah. I mean, the one thing you can say is, well, preacher fell. But you know, he always said he was no good. <laughs> I mean, at least you can say that. He never said he was any good. He always said he was a, came from the bottom feeders and he was low down. So at least you wouldn't expect too much. But it happens. And some of these preachers are so high up, man, that when, 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 when the guy falls, it's like the, the church is just, ooh, like he was the fourth person in the Trinity. What's going on? Made himself of a reputation, maybe. You think if you fall that I'm, I'm going to quit the ministry? And if I fall, you shouldn't quit either. First Corinthians 6, verse 8 to 11 says, and this is interesting, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, we're talking about unrighteous. He's not talking about saved people. I have the righteousness of God. I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. That's what we got going on right now, all this gender stuff, effeminate nor abusers of themselves of mankind, that's homosexuality, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Now you say God can't save a queer, not according to that verse. Or some effeminate drag queen, not according to that verse. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. God says, look, you shouldn't be living like that anymore. You shouldn't be living like that at all. Such were some of you. He said, they won't inherit anything. They're going to inherit a lake of fire is what they're going to get. So why would you want to live after the way they lived? 
And such were some of you. We came from the bottom feeders. We're just like them, but we've been saved. You know, they say the difference between a, a, a Christian and an unsaved man is one's forgiven and one is not. There's a lot of truth to that. But notice it says, He made Himself of no reputation and took upon Him the form of a servant. Now, He willingly did that. You notice that, right? He is the Son of God. He is, he is the King of glory. But He took on the form of a servant. You're a son by birth, but like Christ, we take on the form of a servant. Paul said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. He made himself that. He didn't establish a reputation, although he had one, didn't he? He said, I count it all but dung that I might win Christ. And made himself a servant. Uh, Galatians 4, 7, told you we're going to quote this in four or five times. Wherefore thou art no more a servant... But a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then Galatians 4.1 says, Now I say that an heir, this is what we are, an heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. And that is, yes, you're a child of the king. Yes, you're an heir of God, but you're under tutors and governors. Okay, don't you love your governor? You're under tutors and governors, and guess what? They tell you what to do. They can punish you. Okay? A lot of times they're telling you how to conduct yourself. I mean, kings, before they ever take the throne, are under these tutors and governors, and many of them are beaten, whipped, disciplined, corrected, and under strict scrutiny. You know what we are? We're, that's, that's us down here, man. We're just under strict scrutiny. We're like a servant. And rightly so. The Bible says you're bought with a price, right? God bought you. He said your, your, your body and your spirit, which are God's, He owns them. He gave you the spirit to give you life, and He bought that flesh on the slave block of sin. You belong to Him. Took upon Him the form of a servant. It's interesting that the two offices in the, in the local church are pastors who feed flocks. And deacons, which is the word, which comes from the word servant, the Greek word servant. Deacons are serving tables. Pastors are serving people. It's not time for the reputation. It's not time to reign as a king. It's not time to build uh, build some edifice to yourself. It's time to serve. He said, "Let this mind be in you." Even though I've got this status, man, I mean, I'm loving this status I got. I'm a child of God. I will always be, from this point, from the time I was saved 45 years ago, until eternity ends, if it ever does, and it never will, I am God's son. I'm a child of the king. I like that. But then he says, be a servant now. Be a servant. Feed. Take care of. Lead by example. Not rule. I mean, Peter warned pastors not to lord it over the flock. It's easy to do. Especially when the bigger the flock gets and the more you need to think you need to control things. You try. Listen, if the Word of God won't correct you, I'm not going to. If my preaching doesn't correct you, I don't think you'll be corrected. In fact, that's how I'm to correct you, is with the Word of God. That's how I'm to correct myself. That's of God's business. The Bible says to his own master, he stands or falls. And that's true for any of you. Now, whether you can continue to be a member of this church, if you want to disgrace this church with your testimony, that's a different matter. I may have to come to you and say, look, if you're going to do this, you can't be a member of this church because you're casting a bad light and casting shade on this entire congregation. And that's not right. When you all join, you agree to live a certain way, that you'll live respectable, honest lives before God, and not involve yourself in the things of this world. That's what you said you'd do when you became a member, because I didn't make you become a member. You wanted to become a member. Never expected anybody to be perfect, but I do expect you to at least live up to that to the best of your ability. And I think everybody here would agree, as a church, we expect that. 
Um, then it says in verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Okay? Again, not the time to be exalted or elevated above others. That time will come. I can, if, if, God, uh, if the Lord Jesus says, you're going to rule and reign with me, I, guarantee, I promise you, you'll be, you'll be reigning over others. You'll be telling other people what to do. And now is not that time. Matthew 23, 12, he said, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. See how that works? Not the time to exalt yourself. Not the time to make a big splash and you be the big man or the big woman. Not the time. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves therefore in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. 1 Peter 5.6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. But it's not time. Due time. Matthew 23.11, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. The great ones become servants, not rulers. The pulpit's not a throne. It's a place to feed from, to feed the flock. And you shouldn't be, shouldn't be exalting yourself uh, at the expense of your flock just so you got a name for yourself. Remember, that's, what, that's the reason he came down here and confounded the languages is because they wanted to make a name for themselves. You're not, that's not what we're here for. I best, trust me, I want to stay out of the news. In fact, I'm not trying to get on anybody's radar. I'm really not. I don't involve myself in a lot of other people's business, especially church businesses. I don't, I don't tell other pastors how to, how, to, uh, how to pastor their church, what to, how to feed their church. It's not my business. My business is here and how I feed this church that God's given me. And I, I want to make sure that I do a good job. And so I don't involve myself because I've, 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 I've seen how you can get sucked into other churches' problems. I'm, I, uh, I won't get into it, but you just things go haywire out there. Next thing you know, they got you divided against somebody you were never divided against. I feel for any pastor that's out there trying to feed his flock and minister to his flock. It's tough. We're in Laodicea. We're not in Philadelphia. We are in Philadelphia. Amen? And lastly, he says he humbled, he humbled himself. And then it says he became, be, uh, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus Christ as a servant was obedient even unto death. Ephesians 6, 5 says, Servants... Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. You know, that may not be the same as working for somebody, but it, it means it's still pretty close. I don't think you're, there's nobody, I don't think we have anybody here that's a servant, okay? You're not a bond servant or a, a, um, an indentured servant or anything like that. But he says there, be obedient. That's against what the world thinks. But obviously, if you have an employer, you ought to be obedient to them. They're paying you. He said, exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. The Bible doesn't say the things about slavery and bond servants that the world says. Because the Bible knows these things go on over the, all over the world, not just in... Snowflake America, where it doesn't go on and hasn't gone on for 100 years. No, 150 years, 170 years. But in the rest of the world, it's going on. You know, God says, hey, serve it. Be obedient to your master. I know that. You don't like that? Well, God is our master. Jesus Christ is our master, and we're to be obedient. You're bought and paid for. You can't say that you're against that, but then it's okay for you to believe what you believe about the Scriptures about being sold on a slave block of sin. It's the same thing. Except it took a greater price than what somebody buys a slave for. 
your property. And you belong to God, and you're God's property. Your thought about it doesn't change what's actually going on. You notice that the way people think in America is not reality with the rest of the world. Just ask the rest of the world and they'll tell you. They think Americans are daft. They think we're a bunch of idiots. Because we're over here worried about who can get into the girl's bathroom looking like a man. These, these Americans are crazy. They're nuts. Because we've divorced ourselves really out. You know, you know what's going on in, 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 uh, in, a, in good portions of Africa, in good portions of Asia? Try to eat every day. That's the goal. It's not about gender reassignments. It's not about racial equality. It's about eating a meal every day. And that's their goal. Now you might not think that that will ever be your goal. But you might be surprised. It might very well be your goal. And then things will change. And the things that you worry about, the things people frustrate you about, and worried about the ecology and, you know, oh, the weather and the temperature. and Oh, my goodness. They'll worry you to death about nothing. He became obedient to uh, even the death of the cross. Here's what it boils down to. God needs servants, not masters. He needs servants. God wants obedience, not rebellion. Is this in your mind? Is this mind in you? Do you have the mind of Christ? Because that's his mind. If you're saved, I, I tell you this, you're equal to God. You belong to him. He's in you and you're in him. Man, I mean, there's an equality there. But he wants you to be a servant now. And it's not about how much junk you can get. How, you know, whoever dies with the most toys wins. That's not how it is. I know it seems like that when you're, when you're getting a start and you want to get everything. I can tell you when you get to the end, you want to get rid of everything. Because it's just nothing but a drag on your own. It sucks the life from you. It, it takes the opportunity away from you. Just keep that in mind. Because one of these days you're going to wake up and you say, Man, what have I done for God? What have I done for the Lord? I've spent all this time and I've done nothing for Him. What am I going to do for Him? And you know what you're going to do? You've got to unload a lot of junk before you do. We went to, I mean, we hadn't been married very long, not, not too awful long, and decided to go to Romania. Man, I, man I, I, I'm telling you, I had to sell just about everything. I'm like, oh, I sure hate to part with that. I sure hate to part with that. But is either go is either stay with my junk or go serve God. Now I decided to get rid of my junk. Now I've got just as much junk now. But hopefully the rapture will rid me of it. I hope it don't follow me. If I look behind me and there's a trailer, I will be upset. Because I don't want that junk behind me. It's all junk. And I know we need junk to live, but man, don't you get tired of maintaining it? The older you get, the more you will. Listen, man, sometimes, you know, just, just simplifying your life and say, look, we're going to do this. And I mean, there are retirees that go to the mission field. Do you know that you can live on a mission field on retirement? Maybe raise a little bit of money for the ministry itself, but a retirement money, you can actually live off of it on a foreign field? They're doing it. It's a great opportunity. They said, well, you know, we have really didn't do anything. We just kind of worked a job all of our lives, you know. We were church members and gave and supported missions, that being said. But we want to do something else. We get a steady income from the government. We can live a lot cheaper overseas. We're going over as missionaries. They're, they're, they're doing it. And praise the Lord for them. I mean, just because you're 65 or 60, some of them, I mean, I know guys that have retired you know, 20 and out, 30 and out in the military, 50 years old and younger. Still got a lot of life left in them, a lot of kick left. Could they do something? Even 40s, yeah. If you start early enough, say what? Do something. Do something. And just do something every day. 
Just be that servant every day. Why? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I mean, Jesus didn't wake up and say, well, today I'm just going to do what I want to do. The Bible says he always did those things which pleased the Father. And when I get it in the morning, I think, man, get your Bible open. I grab my Bible, I get it right there. Yes, it's on the floor. Yes, it's by my chair. I grab that Bible and I open that thing up and I start reading it. Because so many days, so many years, I didn't. I didn't. And I realized, man, pretty soon I'm not going to be able to see. Pretty soon the cataracts and everything, I'm, I'm not going to be able to see. I need to read that book now. I need to tell people now. I need to go to the jail now. I need to go to the rest of them now. I need to go to church now. I need to give now. I need to support missions now. Be the servant now. Because you're going to run out of time. Okay, let's all stand. Say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for the book. Thank you for the example of Jesus Christ.